What's happening, everybody? It's Sean with Reactions to the Classics. And today, we got another REM reaction. We got document up this time, brought to us by a friend and longtime supporter and patron of the channel, Brian. Thank you, Brian. He is an REM super fan, and he has his own YouTube channel. If you like this channel, you will like his channel. I will put the link for his down below. Check it out when we are done. Uh, I did green last month for REM, so go check out that reaction also. Uh, whenever I'm done, I did it for another patron, Ian, and it is a uh, it's a fantastic album in itself. It's the one right after this. So Document is their fifth studio album released in August of 97 by IRS Records. First platinum album. It was their first album to be co-produced both by the band and Scott Litt. This was a collaboration that continued through the productions of Green that I just mentioned, Out of Time, the classic Automatic for the People, Monster, and New Adventures in Hi-Fi. The album's clear production and muscular rock riffs both helped to move the band toward mainstream success and built on the work done by Don Gaiman, who had produced the previous album, Life's Rich Pageant. On this one, R.E.M. expanded their instrumentation somewhat, adding a dulcimer to King of the Birds and a saxophone to Fireplace. Later on, obviously, they will add a ton of instruments, but Steve Berlin was brought in to add his saxophone skills because of a prior relationship with the producer, Scott Witt. This experimentation would lead to their adoption of the mandolin, which featured prominently on their subsequent albums, Green and Out of Time. Furthermore, the musicians began swapping instruments, both in concert and in studio, with an effort to create new sounds and avoid stagnation. The original sleeve for the album featured the message, File Under Fire, a reference to what Michael Stipe considered to be the central lyrical theme of the album and also references the chorus to the one I love. A similar message, File Under Water, could be found on the cover of the band's second album, Reckoning. Two rejected su suggestions for the title of the album, REM Number no. 5 and Table of Content, also appear on the sleeve work. As with most of these early REM records, critics loved it. All Music 4.5 out of 5, Pitchfork 8.2 out of 10, Q was 4 out of 5, Rolling Stone was perfect 5 out of 5. All songs, as always, written by Bill Berry, Peter Buck, Mike Mills, and Michael Stipe, except where I point out that they are not. Uh, the, if you don't know the way REM writes their songs, Barry, Buck, and Mills all lay down all the, the musicianship, the instrumentation. They give that usually to Stipe then, and Stipe writes all the lyrics. So an interesting writing process. I have listened to this album one time a long time ago. A long time ago, meaning like a year, year and a half. In my terms of music, that's a long time ago because we, I listen to music every day and shoot videos most days every month. And I know two of these songs because they were hits, but otherwise, I don't really remember it. So I'm really glad Brian brought it. So in full disclosure, I say this on every REM video I do. I was never a fan of REM. Only in the last like a year and a half, I've become a big fan of REM. Before that, not at all, man. They, they barely came out with this album and others when I was in my teens and they were on MTV with some of these videos. I'm like, man, I'm not feeling that. Now I definitely feel it, love them. So I'm glad Brian brought this one. Before we dig in, just a reminder, the music will not be in the video, but it'll be in the Vimeo link below. Otherwise, it'll get blocked. I'll have the lyrics up as always. Let's dive in. And the first song on what they call the page side. A lot of times R.E.M. names their albums, each side a certain thing. This is a page song. Uh, the first track is, as you see, a well, finest work song. It was the third single, went to 50 in the UK. At the time, there was their highest charting success there. This was the last original single the band released on IRS Records, powered by one string strum from Peter Buck through, throughout the song and talks about reform and revolutionary action. What a fantastic song. Now, I found an interview that Michael Stipe did after this album came out. Here's what he said about the album itself, and I think it lends some credence to what this song is about. The American work ethic can be a very ugly thing. Some of the songs on the album deal with the misunderstanding of work as a replacement for feeling or repression of feeling. And I mean, I think what Michael's talking about there, I've seen it all my life. People let their work become everything to them, right? It's all consuming. And, and he's talking about this. In, in the repeating verses, take your instinct by the reins, better best to rearrange your priorities, right? Is work more important or family, your health, those sorts of things. What we want and what we need has been confused, been confused. What we want and what we need are two totally different things. I mean, the Rolling Stones told us this 50 years ago. You can't always get what you want, but you'll get what you need. So I think that's what he's talking about here. You know, I've seen, I've seen people obsessed with work. At one point in my life, I was obsessed with work. And when you do that, it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very slippery slope because you're gonna lose relationships, could drive your health down, could be all of the above. So what a great way to start because I think 
It's that chorus. Oh, your finest hour. It's the way he says finest. It doesn't say finest. It's like finest. You know, I can't do Michael, Michael Justice, but it makes it really stick in your head. Great tune. Now, speaking of jobs, we're going to move on to Welcome to the Occupation. Welcome to the Occupation. Not work occupation. We'll hear the lyrics in a minute, but I thought, as always, and I didn't mention the last song. I should have mentioned. I mean, Buck's guitar work in the last song in the opener was absolutely fantastic. It's great here. Barry's drumming is fantastic. For me, R.E.M. is built on, on Buck and Barry, right? Mike Mills is great. Michael Stipe is great. But that's what it, that trademark sound is built on. So this one, Welcome to the Occupation, is most likely, and you can kind of read between the lines and really see it in some certain things. The occupation the United States did, and I'm not trying to get all political here, but you've got to have a little education on it if you don't know. In the 80s, when Ronald Reagan was president, he went to war with you know, war of military occupations of these little countries in Central America and South America and propped up dictators that while they were not communists, we were fighting communism, they were horrible to their people. I think that's what that's talking about. This is not your occupation of your job. Hang your collar up inside, hang your dollar bill on me, listen to the water still, listen to the cause where you are. Fed and educated, primitive and wild, welcome to the education. Here we stand and here we fight all your fallen heroes. Held and died and skinned alive, listen to the Congress fire. Offering the educated, primitive and loyal, welcome to the uh, education. Then one of the lines in the course three, fire on the hemisphere below. So we're going after sugar cane and coffee cup, copper, steel and cattle. And I mean, in Central America, the sugar cane and the coffee were huge and still are huge exports. But American companies, when they're cleared a lot of that area out, copper, steel and cattle. And then he just gets into the listen to me, listen to me. And the more desperate as it ends out, what do we got there? Seven, seven listens to me. So also a fantastic track. This thing is starting off fire. And we're not going to get away from any controversial lyrics on this one for sure. Exhuming McCarthy makes an explicit parallel between the red baiting of Joe McCarthy's time, which is the 1950s in America, and the strengthening of the sense of American exceptionalism during the Reagan era, especially the Iran-Contra affair. Starting with the click clack of a typewriter, it also includes a sound clip of Joseph Welsh's rebuke of McCarthy from the Army McCarthy hearings. It says, let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. You've done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you left no sense of decency? And if you know anything about Joseph McCarthy, he ruins so many people's lives. Go Google it. That's what we do in today's world. Re read the wiki for it. It was uh, unbelievable. So I expect this one to have some fire lyrics. Exhuming McCarthy. Mike Mills gets a lot more bass work in this one than he did the previous two. Much more interesting sounding. Um, I don't like the the arrangement of it as much as the previous two songs, but it, it is very catchy. And, you know, you could break these lyrics down and come up with a hundred different meanings because Michael Stipe usually doesn't like to talk about what his songs are about. But I mean, of course, you're sharpening stones. So probably casting stones, walking on coals. A lot of people back in the 80s, you know, self-help gurus walk on the coals. You can do anything you want. Walk across these hot coals to improve your business acumen. So that's where I kind of am assuming that. And first two, vested interest, united ties, landed gentry, rationalized. Look who bought the myth by Jingo, by American, because by America, because it was a huge thing in the 80s. Congress even passed this thing about by American. Didn't have any legislative power, but... Uh, I think that's what he's talking about there. And then verse three, enemy side and enemy met. I'm addressing the real politic, which is this ideology politically. And I won't even go into because it's a, it's a long story. Look who bought the myth by Jingo by America. And then the bridge is actually that quote against McCarthy that I told you about. And I mean, that that's kind of it. I mean, at the very end, exhuming McCarthy. And then they're, they're kind of singing in the background, meet me at the book burning. So, you know, basically saying, that there's a huge red scare in the 80s. I mean, that's what the Reagan administration really played up, right? The communists are coming. I mean, I lived through that where you're worried is there going to be a nuclear war? You know, I still lived in that era before the wall fell. And I know Brian did too, who brought this reaction to many of you watching. So you remember that, right? And you remember the, the angst was heightened up. You better watch out. We better do all these things or, or the commies are coming for us. So uh, he's just kind of, uh, starts kind of playing that up in the lyrics. Now we'll go to Disturbance at the Heron House. Michael Stipe actually commented on this one. He said this song was based off of Animal Farm. It tells the story of putting monkeys in cages. Stipe is really telling the story of how Reagan ran the country during his 
presidency is what many speculate. Disturbance at the Heron House, the actual title of the song doesn't come up till the first line of the third verse. I mentioned when it started, obviously Buck's guitar work is on point. As it always is, the musicianship is fantastic. As far as the lyrics go, I'm not going to just break them down. You don't always got to break down R.E.M.'s lyrics. Sometimes it's more about the sound and the general idea of the song, the concept of the, of the lyricism than the lyricism itself. He does say in the third one, Disturbance at the Heron House. Oh, a couple notes I found said it was a possible pun on the German Heron House, Manor House Mansion, but who knows? A stampede at the monument to liberty and honor under the honor roll. Just a gathering of the grunts and greens, the cogs and grunts and hirelings. A meeting of a mean idea to hold. In other words, the concept that's been from time immemorial where the leaders decide what's going to happen and then the common folk, us, carry that out, whether it's militarily or in businesses. So I think that's kind of what he is coming up at here. And now we're up to Strange. Remember in the opening when I said every song's written by them except when I tell you that's not? Well, this is the song that's not. It's written by Bruce Gilbert, Graham Lewis, Colin Newman, and Robert Gray. They were the post-punk band Wires. So they originally recorded this song for their debut album. R.E.M. speeds it up a little bit, faster tempo, slightly altered lyrics. There's a, a line that's Joey's nervous. They change it to Michael's nervous. Let's check it out. Strange. Now, I can tell in the first five seconds I mentioned it. You can tell with the guitar work, the way it's straight up guitar, not that jangly effect that this is not an R.E.M. written song. You tell almost right away, but it really works, right? It's, it's so much fun. I'm glad they sped up the tempo. I've never heard the original, but it, it the sped up tempo and just the way Michael sings it, it, it gives you that feeling of almost angst. You know, on the line, Michael's nervous and the lights are bright. There's something going on that's not quite right. It fits with the overall tone of this first side as well, where we're kind of ramping up, you know, first your actual occupation and then the political climate and the communism scare and all this. It's, it's amping up that like angst. So I, I really did enjoy that. There's something going on tonight. There's something going on that's not quite right. And then you just get the Michaels nervous and the lights are bright. There's something going on that's not quite right. And that's that's all this thing does. And then the bridge says, there, there's something going on that wasn't here before. Keep your eyes glued to the floor. No one's going to save your life. There's something going on that's not quite right. And then verse five is just the same thing. So there's a bunch of repetition, but it's a two and a half minute song that is a ton of fun. Well, now we're up to the last track on side A. And even if you don't know any REM tracks, most people know this, and they especially know this. As I filmed this in October of 2021, they know this because of the COVID worldwide pandemic that started last year. And we're still living through at the time of this filming. It's the end of the world as we know it and I feel fine. The second single went to 69 in the US, 39 in the UK on re-release in 1991. And this track is known for its quick flying, seemingly stream of consciousness rant with many diverse references, such as a quartet of individuals with the initials LB. We have Leonard Bernstein, Leonid Brezhnev, Winnie Bruce, and Lester Banks. In a 90s interview with Musician Magazine, Michael Stipe claimed that the LB references came from a dream he had in which he found himself at a party surrounded by famous people who all shared those initials. He said the words come from everywhere. He explained to Q Magazine in 1992, I'm extremely aware of everything around me, whether I'm in a sleeping state, awake, dream state, or just in a day-to-day -day life. So that, ended, so that ended up in the song along with a lot of stuff I'd seen when I was flipping TV channels. It's a collection of streams of consciousness. All right, Michael. Michael's always aware. Huh? He's always woke. The song originated from a previously unreleased song called PSA, Public Service Announcement. The two are very similar in melody and tempo. PSA was itself later reworked and released as a single in 2003 under the title Bad Day. An interview with Guitar World published in November of 96, Peter Buck agreed that End of the World was in the tradition of Bob Dylan's subterranean homesick blues. What a fantastic song that is. And as I mentioned, amid the global pandemic, the song received an increase in downloads and streaming in March of 2020, alongside other apocalypse and sickness-themed songs. Online downloads of the song rose 184%, while streams rose 48%. Hey, man, let's hope we don't have to revisit this song anytime soon. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I feel fine. I'll tell you what, this is just an example of R.E.M.'s brilliance, right? I mean, the drumming on this by Barry is absolutely fantastic. It drives the entire song. And then just the rapid fire, just the way it's arranged and the catchiness of it. And they know to finish the last minute and a half with instrumentation overlaid and 
the chorus being repeated. So that's all you hear because you could spend literally an hour breaking this song down. Don't worry, I'm not going to. But you could because of all the one-liners and stuff thrown out here. It's almost like a years later, uh, a few years later, maybe two years later from the release of this, Billy Joel did We Didn't Start the Fire, a very similar rapid fire uh, delivery and all these different lyrics and then the chorus coming in this very anthemic. Very similar. I don't know if he took any inspiration from this, but there are similarities to it. I'm not going to get into, I mean, it, it's all the things that the end of the world could be, right? That's great. It starts with an earthquake, got birds and snakes and aeroplane. Lenny Bruce is not afraid. I have a hurricane. Listen to yourself. Churn. World serves its own needs. Don't misserve your own needs. Speed it up a notch. Speed grunt. No string. Boy, I could just go into it, but you don't want to hear that. Uh-oh. Overflow. Population. Common food. Better to do. Save yourself. Serve yourself. World serves its own. Listen to your heart bleed. And then we get into the whole, it's the end of the world. Six o'clock TV hour, don't get caught in a foreign tower. So the TV news, you know, if you watch the TV news, man, it's always bad stuff. Slash and burn, return, listen to yourself, turn. So he builds on things. And then the third verse, the other night, I dreamt of knives, continental drift divide, mountains sit in a line. Leonid Brezhnev, Lenny Bruce and Wester Banks, birthday party, cheesecake, jelly bean, boom. You symbi symbiotic, patriotic, slam, but neck, right, right. So I read that verse. That's verse three. Because this is what Michael will do at times, right? He just kind of throws nonsensical stuff in there. And please don't send in the comments that you break this verse down and tell me what it all means. I'm just saying that certain times he'll just throw stuff in there. You're like, all right, that all fits together. It all sounds great when you're just singing it over this type of arrangement. What a great song. I know you probably heard this song if you're watching this a million times, but when you sit down and listen to it like this in the context of the album, read the lyrics, you realize how great this song is, even if you've heard it a thousand times or five thousand times. That's the end of the A side, or as they called it, the page side. So we'll go to side two now, the leaf side. And the song that really put them on the map, you see it below, the one I love. First hit single, nine in the U.S., 14 in Canada, 16 in the U.K. on its re-release in 1991. In March of 2005, Q Magazine placed this at number 57 in its list of 100 greatest guitar tracks. In 2012, Slant Magazine listed it as the 38th best single of the 80s. It's become a popular radio dedication to loved ones, relying on a misinterpretation of its refrain. This one goes out to the one I love. However, subsequent lyrics in the same verse contradict the love song interpretation. It's just a darker, more manipulative theme, a simple prop to occupy my time. Michael Stipe talked about this way back when the album came out in 1987. He talked to Rolling Stone magazine. He said, I've always left myself pretty open to interpretation. This is true if you know R.E.M. It's probably better that they think that they just think it's a love song at this point. However, in an interview in the January 80, 1988 issue of Musician Magazine, he said the song was incredibly violent and added, it's very clear that it's about using people over and over again. So I think probably when the album came out, it's like people can interpret it however they want. Then they kept interpreting it the wrong way and he felt like he had to clarify. Song contains only three verses, the first two of which are identical. The third verse changes the line, a simple prop to occupy my time to another prop has occupied my time. The chorus consists of just the word fire repeated over the backing vocal of she's coming down on her own now. She's coming down on her own, which is sung by Mike Mills. So a little preview of the lyricism. It's more about the feel and ambiance of the song, as it is with a lot of R.E.M. songs. Let's check it out. The one I love, I already gave you the lyrical breakdown on a little preview before this one. It's all about really the way this one is presented, right? Even on the chorus, the fire, the way Michael sings it, you might not even know what he's saying there. You know, the fire... It obviously, I'm a broken record, no pun intended, but Buck's guitar work, Barry's drumming drives this song. And I mean, Mike Mills is kind of always the forgotten guy on my reviews, but he does a fantastic job on the bass. Uh, the song itself, like I said, there's not a lot to it, but it serves its purpose. And just another example of how people don't listen to it. They, they know the chorus of something and they don't listen to the lyrics at all. Don't dedicate this song to your significant other. Just a word of advice from Sean here. All right, let's move on. Well, we got four songs left, and there's really no research on any of them. I'm the research guy. I couldn't find much on them, but we're going to move from the fire chorus of the one I love to fireplace. Fireplace. So, interesting, there's not just horns on here, but Steve Berlin on the horns. The last minute plus is just him going out on the horns with, with Stipe just doing a little vocal over it, but not, not words, just a little noise over it. You also had a Fairlight synthesizer from Carl Marsh on this one. What this song is about, who knows? There's speculation from some. It's based on a speech by Mother Ann Lee, an 18th century leader of the religious sect 
shakers. I can't tell you that that's actually the case, but that's what someone here is speculating. It just has this fireplace motif, right? It goes from, in, in each each verse and chorus, it goes from shake the rug into the fireplace, turns into sweep the floor into the fireplace, and then throw the chairs into the fireplace. And finally, we throw the wall into the fireplace. So throughout this album, fire has, has been kind of returning in here. It, it's kind of symbolic for you standing up to speak. And so in this song, I guess they're telling us that there's there's nothing left to, to fuel that speech. I don't know. I mean, and, and Michael might not even know, but he probably has something in mind. Now we'll go to Lightning Hopkins. Now, Sam John Lightning Hopkins was an American blues musician who, was in, who has influenced many great rock bands of the 60s. So I'm guessing that's who this is about, but let's check out the lyrics. Lightning Hopkins, let's return to the theme that I keep bringing up, and that's the fact that Peter Buck's guitar work is fantastic and Bill Berry's drumming is fantastic. And that's what absolutely drives the song. Berry actually had the most interesting part of the last song, Fireplace, and that he had this offbeat drumming that recurred throughout that, that really caught your attention. This one is just a standard, awesome drumming performance. And then Buck, instead of the jangly, we're just going in, man. Really, really good guitar work. As far as what this song's about, who the heck knows? I give you an example, verse three. Hound bark on the track. Hound crow hold on to your hat. Lightning one, lightning one. The lowlands, timberlands, badlands, birdlands. Hey man, up to you to figure this one out. I mean, the first verse, I thought we might be going somewhere when I lay myself to sleep, pray that I don't go too deep. Lightning one, lightning one, because it's cold down. Cold down there, crow. So I thought we were gonna get somewhere there, and, and you know, maybe some of you guys can interpret this better than me, but I thought that, oh, oh, the, that little chorus back there, that and the drumming and the guitar was the most interesting thing of this song for me. We had a crow in the last song. Now we're gonna go to King of Birds. King of Birds. Buck plays the dulcimer on here. That's what you're hearing there. That gives it this interesting texture to it. And from the very start of it, it sounded different than anything else we heard on here. And that's what I liked about it. I don't know what he's talking about. He references standing on the shoulder of giants several times, which you know no one gets anywhere unless they they stand on the shoulders of the giants that came before him. In other words, no idea is original, but he says he wants a mean idea or a main idea. There's some speculation of what he's actually saying here to call my own. A hundred million birds fly. So that's that's I mean where we get the bird motif, but just a fantastic put together song to sonically. Uh, it, it's very interesting. I said the dulcimer helps, and obviously the usual great. Great instrumentation and, and enjoyed Michael's vocal performance on here. And once again, proof throwback to the first album, Murmur. The lyrics don't have to 100% gel into having any idea what he's talking about. It just sounds good, right? Sometimes it's as simple as that in the music world. And now we go to the last song and the longest song. We got Oddfellows Local 151. And Peter Buck actually gave an interview in 1992 to Q Magazine about this song. He said that song is actually about all these winos who used to live down the street from us. They used to live in cars. We called them the Motor Club. These old guys would sleep in the cars and drink all the time. I think there was a guy called Pee Wee as well. Michael Stey, not Mills. Knew them because he used to live right next door to them. Every once in a while, you'd give them five bucks or drop off a bottle. Hey man, gotta help the guys out. All right, let's check it out. It is the longest song on this album. There you have it, Odd Fellows Local 151. Actually my least favorite song on this album. It's fine. Uh, I think they probably wanted to end it this way. It has a little harder edge to it, just as far as the the delivery of it. And it's probably a good way to end an album that has this kind of serious content on it. You know, Oddfellows Local 151, Behind the Firehouse, they're kind of just making it like they're a union, right? These homeless guys are a union. Where Pee Wee, who, who was interviewed in the reference, sits to prove a sage to teach. Pee Wee gathered up his proof, reached up to scratch his head, his proof is alcohol. Fell down and hit the ground again. Firehouse, firehouse. Um, so yeah, I mean that's kind of what the song is about. It's fine. It's just not not. Uh, it's my least favorite song on here. It's not horrible or anything. And that's a nice segue to my favorite tracks, and they're dominated by side one. I have one honorable mention: King of Birds, uh, the song before this one. My faves are Finest Work Song, Welcome to the Occupation, Strange, the cover that I thought was so good. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine, and the one I love. I know it's three of the singles, but they're singles for a reason. They're fantastic songs. 
that's going to transition me to my overall grade, which by what I made my favorite songs is going to kind of go with how I'm going to grade this album because I think the first side is super strong. Obviously starts out great with the one I love. Then I think there's a little bit of a fall off there. I still think it's a really good album. It doesn't hit for me nearly as much as Green does or even, you know, Murmurs, my, my favorite debut album of anyone of all time, but still a really good album. I'm going to be at a 7.5 on this one. I do have a feeling that the second side would definitely reward you with repeated listens. So that's kind of the hard thing on a first time reaction. I said I heard this album once. I didn't really remember any of it. It's in the context of listening to a bunch of albums in a row. So I think repeated listens would definitely uh, reward me on this one. But appreciate uh, Brian for bringing this one always. Like I said, check out his channel. The link is below. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. If you'd like to be a Patreon like Brian is, they keep this thing going. Check out the Patreon link below or the link on the end screen. Until next time, guys, I will see you.